Okay, so uh, good morning, good afternoon, good middle of the day to, um, to all of you who are either here in person in Bangkok or tuning in from outside. Welcome to this dialogue on evidence for sustainable ocean management. And as you are all aware, this dialogue, which we will now be having for a bit more than an hour, is held and organized as part of the fifth Asia Pacific Day for the Ocean. My name is Rika Hansen, and I oversee the work of SCAP on economic and environment statistics. And I also have the pleasure to co-chair the Global Ocean Accounts Partnership which some of you would have, have heard also the head of SCAP, Ibo Amida, mention in her opening uh, remarks just 20 minutes ago or so. Um, SCAP co-chairs the Global Ocean Accounts Partnership together with Fisheries and Oceans Canada. And it is in that capacity that I have the honor and privilege to opening this dialogue today. Now, the involvement by SCAP and by myself in ocean accounting began around almost five years ago now, where governments in Asia and the Pacific stressed the importance of sustainable management of oceans and also recognized the lack of data to support sound decision making. That prompted uh, a number of activities uh, in Asia and the Pacific to pilot ocean accounting. And uh, among those first movers were China, Malaysia, Samoa, Thailand, and Vietnam. And it, I'm very pleased that we will be hearing about some of these efforts from both Samoa and from Vietnam uh, today. Since then, uh, there's even more activities uh, in, in, in uh, an ever-increasing number of countries and uh, and uh, among the countries uh, now taking steps to develop uh, their ocean accounts is uh, both Indonesia and the Maldives that we will also hear more from today. Now, those initial efforts also led to the establishment of the Global Ocean Accounts Partnership, which since that initial establishment has grown stronger, both in terms of number of people working for the partnership, the kind of funding that's been raised in this space, and also the number of members of this partnership, which uh, continues to grow. And I want to take the opportunity now to thank uh, the GOAP Secretariat for co-organizing this dialogue uh, today, uh, and also thank uh, others, including my own team, who've been involved in, in organizing uh, this dialogue. And I think that's a good place for me to hand over to a representative from the Global Open, uh, uh, Ocean Accounts Partnership, namely you, Michael, Michael Burnside, who is the sustainable, the, sorry, the Secretariat Manager of Programs at GOAP. So now I'm using the acronym. I hope that can maybe make things a little bit shorter. And uh, uh, Michael will say a few things about the global call for better ocean data collection and organization. So Michael, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Rike. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, there is a book that I quite like by R. Buckmeister Fuller called an operating manual for Spaceship Earth. A crazy title, but the concept of Spaceship Earth is pretty simple. And that is that we are all astronauts on board a giant spaceship, Earth, flying through space. We don't know where we're going, but the life support system is precisely calibrated to ensure our continued survival. It sustainably provides nourishing food, water and shelter it regulates climate and disease, maintains nutrient cycles and oxygen production. It helps to recycle many waste products, including carbon dioxide. It protects us from radiation and the harsh vacuum of space. This book was published over 50 years ago, and since then we astronauts have really begun to make a mess of some of these critical life support systems. The spaceship's alarms are ringing, the lights are flashing, and Spaceship Earth is in need of maintenance. 
Where should we put our attention first? Into what should we invest our limited time and money? Thankfully, our ability to understand what is going on in the natural world is advancing rapidly. Instruments to measure change are ever improving and complex environmental systems are increasingly well understood. But we need to work together to contribute our collective knowledge for a clearer picture now and in the future to drive sustainable development for the ocean. The 2030 Agenda recognises that social and economic development depends on sustainable management of our, our planet's natural resources, including oceans and seas, and the biodiversity and ecosystems within, highlighted by Goal 14. Commitments to measure and manage progress are also embedded in the post-2020 global, global biodiversity framework and 2020 commitments of the 16 heads of government represented on the high level panel for a sustainable ocean economy. Earlier this year at the UN Oceans Conference in Lisbon, our leaders reiterated commitments to strengthen scientific and systematic observation and data collection efforts, including of environmental data and improved sharing and dissemination of data and knowledge. They committed to making data widely accessible through open access, investing in national statistical systems, standardizing data, ensuring interoperability between databases and, th and synthesizing data into information for policy and decision makers. Meeting these commitments depends on urgent collaborative action to compile and use ocean accounts, which connect social, economic and environmental information about the ocean in coherent and comparable formats in line with international statistical standards. I hope that this session today strengthens our mutual awareness concerning measurement and organization of that information. Recognizing the critical role of accounts as a foundation for measurement, innovation, investment, management and planning towards sustainable ocean development. It's the information that we need to better pilot Spaceship Earth. Thank you and back to you, Rike. Thank you so much, Michael, and uh, I hope you've all settled in on our spaceship here. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, I thought this uh, this is bringing us very much to the heart of what we really wanted the dialogue to focus on today, which, which, is, which is very much the link between data and decision making uh, and the fact that, uh, that if we do want to have uh, a better management of our ocean, is it, it is important to, to really take into account the different development dimensions, which is also what makes all of us put value on oceans and uh, that is really central to making the data work for us yeah so thanks very much michael and uh, this uh, brings us to the main part of our dialogue today so if if you could take a seat there and we'll just do a little reorganization you stay here fear downs i will change my hat now to the moderator and i'll ask uh, our two panelists to just sit up here. Yeah, I'm just checking in to see if our virtual panelist is with us. Um, is there anyone from Samoa, the Ministry of Natural Resources and the Environment? Not yet. We'll hope, hopefully, hopefully we'll be able to have a full panel. We have a hybrid panel today uh, of uh, of both in-person speakers and also one virtual panelist. And um, let me just introduce our speakers before I I give the floor to to you for your presentation. Uh, we we uh, have a, a representative here today from Indonesia, Mr. Firdaus Agung, who is the director of marine conservation and biodiversity of the Ministry of Marine Affairs and Fisheries. So welcome to you, Fjordaus. Um, on our panel, we have uh, here to my right, uh, Ms. Kim Titui Nok, uh, who is the head uh, of the Division of Science and International Cooperation of the Institute of Strategy and Policy on Natural Resources and Environment, also known to me and maybe to many others as Isbonre in short. 
uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, Nok is from Vietnam. And further to my right is Ms. Ilham Atto Mohammed, who is the Assistant Director of the Ministry of Environment, Climate Change and Technology uh, of the Maldives. So welcome to you, Ilham. And uh, hopefully very shortly we'll be joined by our virtual panelist, uh, who is uh, Ms. Moira Falitulu, who is the Assistant Chief Executive Officer of the Environment Sector Coordination Division of the Ministry of Natural Resources and the Environment of Samoa. Uh, so hopefully uh, we will uh, manage uh, connection problems or whatever is, is preventing our final panelists to join. But let's first kick off with um, a bit of a presentation before we move into a full-fledged panel. And uh, it is my pleasure to invite you, Fiedaus, to uh, provide an overview on data for better ocean management in Indonesia. You have the floor, please. Thank you, uh, Rika, uh, distinguished participants, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, let me start this uh, talk with uh, echoing what Ibu Armida said in during the opening that uh, there is a great demand now for a better and relevant evidence to support the ocean policy and also a better understanding or enhanced understanding on the interaction between socio-economic and environment for our ocean uh, management. So these two great points from her is exactly uh, part of the context of our presentation uh, or my presentation uh, this afternoon on the data for better ocean management. Next. Uh, uh, yes, this is the common issues and I agree all of us that sometimes these common issues become common excuses also for not doing anything or for doing things minimally because of data is expensive to collect. There is no project to support it, there is no budget to support it and data is not available or only for a limited location, limited time, limited uh, skill or data is scattered in many institutions, sharing is uh, something not easy to do. Uh, and then data is available, but no information is produced. So data and information is something different. So maybe we have many data, but information is very limited because there is no further extraction, analysis, or evaluation on the data. Next. So this is the reality, actually. In our in context in Indonesia, for example, the data driven or science based policy is mandated through many laws, in particular in fisheries laws, marine and coastal management law, and ocean law. And other sectoral institutions also has mandated uh, to have a good uh, a data, for example, in marine transportation and tourism. But there is a reality in that availability and the need is sometimes in a different situation. So data are scattered and collected for each ministry's interest, standard, methodology. Data sharing is encouraged, actually, but lack of incentive to do so. And we need tools to facilitate data sharing and create common and mutual interest. So this is very important to have a common and mutual interest and mutual benefit to engage everybody and to bring everybody uh, in board. Next. So our minister, actually take that leadership using the initiative for ocean accounting during the third global dialogue uh, he presented how actually indonesia initiate to create common interest as a case start if you look at on the ocean health index for example so many variables so many data are needed and it is scattered among uh, uh, stakeholders among ministries so the minister tried to start with the three pillars in Indonesian ocean governance, healthy ocean, productive ocean, and ocean prosperity. And then we cascade these three major uh, targets into each of line ministry key performance indicators. So once every aspect of these three elements become key performance indicator of line ministries, then we can uh, relatively easy to ask them to get input. It will create common interest and common goals because everybody will see what they are doing is part of their KPI. Everything that they are doing in this work 
are part of the achievement of their KPI. So this make people freely to join and happy to join and to put resource even in our example uh, together with the Minister of Marine and Fisheries to initiate the ocean accounting for this one and a half a year. Next, so how actually all the data are pulled together and put together uh, to make us a key integrator and as an instrument to for ocean management. So let me use the ocean accounting as an example because ocean accounting represents uh, the situation where so many different types of data, so many different types of survey can be done and can be integrated and can be pulled and can be presented in a systematic way in a very easy way to understand and very easy to compare between times, between location, and the, and the methodology that already approved and agreed uh, in the global. So every ocean accounting module, for example, we have five modules actually now on the asset, on the economic activity, pollution, ocean economy and governance, and then we put it down or we break it down, break it down into the uh, element element and will be part of the key performance indicator of line ministries and then we use that information as a permit and license mechanism under the marine uh, spatial plan where conservation mariculture marine tourism mining transportation energy and housing can be represented in each module of the ocean accounting so that's how the data coming from the survey from a different uh, purposes from the different ministries can be gathered together uh, to make or to build up the ocean accounting data and information and use together as a part of a monitoring and tracking tool to know that we are in the right direction to achieve our key performance uh, indicator. Next, so how actually better management will be uh, look like in the reality? So we can see it through a, a, a two different spectrum for decision making into reporting, for example. So decision making on the permit and granting and monitoring and evaluation, decision making on the benefit and cost analysis of every policy option will be supported by uh, scientific based uh, evidence or uh, transparent uh, evidence from the ocean accounting even budget allocation is proportionate to asset value that is managed by each ministry and then every site with the ocean accounting uh, number that is uh, in a still in a good condition or increasing time by time is the priority site to be conserved and also claim and damage of damage from human activities can be supported also through the valuation of the asset that is uh, undertaken through the ocean accounting and even for the consolidated and coordinated performance report for every ministry for the uh, president to the parliament and even for reporting to all the international multilateral agreement also can be uh, produced uh, easily or relatively easy compared to previous uh, reporting system once we have all the data is collected compile, analyze, and present it to uh, using the ocean accounting. Through this decision-making process, we are confident that we have a better future for the sustainable ocean, and we can show and present to the public that we are doing in the right way. Next. So this is in practice, actually. We have three uh, tools or measures that, that now applying in our ocean management. The first one is marine spatial planning. Second one is marine protected area. The third one is fisheries management. This is the three biggest uh, measures that is uh, applying in Indonesia. But of course, we also uh, working on the transportation and, and tourism. Uh, space allocation, zoning, permit, license, permit or license granting is part of the marine spatial planning work where it will be applied and it will be a binding to all marine uses by sectors and industry, including uh, community. And then through MBA, effective uh, management, the scorecard, the zone management, is also using ocean accounting, using data that is uh, generated through ocean accounting to apply to all MBA and affect sectors and community uh, or industry use uh, within or uh, surrounding the MBA. And for fisheries management, the stock population, quota for industry, also based on the 
data on the information that is generated through the development of ocean accounting. So every single uh, measures that are applied will be monitored and tracked use uh, ocean accounting status uh, through two different time of uh, measurements. So this is the plan actually, and we are starting uh, this work uh, with the help of UNSCAP and uh, Coop uh, for one and a half year for now. This is the last one. Uh, next, how in uh, example of implementation. So now in our ocean, we have a zoning uh, arranged by marine spatial planning and legalized through the government regulation and the uh, local government regulation. So every uh, owner of the permit, we have the name, activity, duration, investment value, and we have where they are and in terms of zoning. And within that area, within that zone, what is the, uh, our ecosystem uh, condition? our ecosystem value and our uh, ecosystem extent. Then we have a grid, we make the smallest possible grid that we can uh, 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 achieve. For example, national, local, and then site. And then for two different time of measurement, we compare the change of our ecosystem extent, the change of goods and services flow from our ecosystem to economy, and then the pollution level produced by the activity on the red dot on the left side, and then ocean economy generated from all the economic activities, and then ocean governance apply into that area. So the policy response or decision making will be either halt or continue the new permit grant because the ocean accounting is still in the good or increasing, or the ocean accounting is decreasing, so we have to stop all permit or apply restoration obligation. So every owner of the permit, they have to do the restoration if they want to continue their activity or they want to renewal their permit or increase fee to cover risk or restoration activity because every activity has to pay uh, tax, non-tax to the government and we can increase the non-tax uh, uh, fee based on the damage that is uh, uh, created by their uh, activities or modify the zone because the zone is not uh, fit anymore to the condition of the ecosystem and condition of the investment there or adjust the MPA to more effective protection. So that is the vision for our uh, ocean accounting work in Indonesia. And as Bu Armida said in the opening that the momentum is there. So Indonesia really would like to invite all the countries in this region and also UNS Cup and co-op to work together and to make this ocean accounting become more apparent, more visible, and more prominent in the future uh, because it will be become a greater demand for this uh, region and the global. Thank you, Rika. Back to you. Hmm. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Fiedas. And I think you all. Uh, 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 you all can see from this presentation that a lot of activity is going on in Indonesia and it's really impressive. Um, I also, I mean, thanks also for, for the invitation to collaborate. Uh, there's a lot we can all learn from the efforts uh, of Indonesia and, and actually it just takes me back to, to yesterday where some of us had the opportunity to discuss in a workshop how we can establish uh, an Asia Pacific community of practice on ocean accounting so that hopefully will give us all a lot of opportunities to to collaborate more going forward. Um, I, I want to invite if anyone has a, a question to to fear ours uh, if, if no one does, then I have a few but uh, is there anyone in the room who has any questions to the excellent presentation that we just heard. Nope. Is there any online questions? No. Well, um, I I want to. Well, first, I just wanted to highlight the the, the last part of your presentation there, Fiedos, where you really make a very close link to the type of policy response that you would expect from various results that are actually coming out of the ocean accounts, and I think that those very practical examples of what could be responses is something that at least I will 
note down and use it because anyone who's involved in this accounting work um, will know that it's so difficult to explain uh, you know, oh, you put together these tables and then, and then what? Yeah. So uh, I thought that was uh, an excellent uh, addition there on your last slide, Fjordals. And, and then I have uh, two questions. Um, I have the pleasure to also collaborate with Indonesia on uh, disaster related data and statistics. And one of the things that have been put in place in Indonesia is what is called the one disaster data. And this is um, uh, uh, this is a result of, as I understand it, uh, a national policy on one data. Uh, and I just wonder if that has also played a role in uh, the initiatives that you have taken uh, with uh, in in terms of uh, ocean management and and managing related data. So that was my first question. And then my second is a more specific one where you uh, you outline uh, tracking and monitoring change um, on on different aspects um, uh, extent uh, service condition etc but you also mentioned governance there if you could give us an example or two of what a change in governance could be um, yeah so those were my questions thank you uh, for the excellent response Yes, of course, the, we have a similar situation with your experience in uh, developing the disaster data. Because now in Indonesia, uh, once again, this is uh, one thing that uh, other countries can learn and uh, uh, do the, or adjust the, the, the same situation. Uh, we have a, a policy that we call it the one data policy and one map policy. So every data coming from many different institutions uh, are mandatory to be pulled in the in the one system so everybody can see everybody can access but of course there is a level of access depend on the security depend on the consideration that different uh, level of uh, Authority will have different level of access, but, but in general, everybody can see, can access, and uh, can uh, uh, exercise what kind of information they, they can uh, or they need for their activity. For example, if I'm a, a private company, I would like to invest something, for example, the aquaculture in a certain area, then I can access all the, the data, what is uh, the zoning over there, uh, what is the existing activities over there, uh, what is the permit requirement, what is the fee, and what is the environmental situation, and things like that. But of course, if I want to have more detailed information on the biophysical information, on the chemical information, then I need to, to, to do something more. But at least I know and the place where uh, I would like to make an investment uh, in, in general. So that's really helpful to start to initiate the ocean accounting work in Indonesia to address the issue on the data sharing and data availability. And the second one is the, the ocean governance module is the fifth module that uh, part of the priority modules that uh, are initiated in Indonesia and will be produced soon. Uh, to make sure that, or actually, why we need that uh, that module? Because we would like to know what kind of governance are there that will affect or will be affected by ecosystem extent, condition, monetary value, and all the flow of uh, goods and services to economy and flow of uh, pollution to environment. So the interaction between the ecosystem, the socio-economic will be uh, governed by the governance and it will be not only in the national governance but also the regulation coming from the local government regulation coming or regulation uh, conducted by the local community indigenous community for example uh, the local government may change their policy because there is a change on the uh, on the local leader for example the governor the governor change every five years and they change the policy to to uh, to prioritize the the ocean uh, sector for example in the previous uh, governor 
he or she prioritize on uh, aquaculture, but the current governor, he or she prioritize on uh, ecotourism. So it will create uh, a change on the how you manage your ocean, how you allocate your zone, and how you uh, give permit license for other mm -hmm. sectors. So we have to know and we have to track what is the change of the policy in the local level, in the national level, affect the situation on our ecosystem extent and uh, all, all the goods and services coming uh, flow from the uh, ecosystem to the, uh, to the economy. Thank you, Rick. Yeah, thanks very much, uh, Fiedos. And I think that addition of the governance aspect sounds to me like something that's really useful because this is one of those aspects that if you keep the knowledge here it becomes rather essential for continuing this shared understanding that you talked about in the beginning or common interest that you talked about in exactly. the beginning exactly. um, to make sure that who are the stakeholders at any given point and what are their interests uh, so so thanks very much and i i also find that this national policy on one data one map etc could prompt more ministries to maybe go out and do or ministers what your minister has also done saying okay what how can we work together to put things uh, to put also the data we all use into a framework that is actually useful for our various purposes that may be rather differentiated yeah thanks very much i saw we have um one question online and i think we should pick that one up but i will ask you Fierhaus, to be very brief in your response to that one could i just see the comments please the chat so there's a there's a a, a question here from uh, angela from fao uh, asking whether the the data uh, may be shared uh, publicly and then she's adding to uh, asking about how the different trade-offs for decision making are being taken into account by using the tools that you also mentioned in the presentation Yes, the answer is yes, the data can be accessed uh, publicly, but of course the, the level and the detail will be different depending on the type of data and depending on the uh, security or safety or whatever consideration uh, applied by the owner of the data, but in general, yes, this is accessible. For the trade-off, actually this is uh, not yet uh, exercise because we we are on the beginning of development of ocean accounting and we are on the beginning of idea how to apply uh, all the map all the tables on uh, 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 exact situation of, of uh, ocean uh, uses right now and we haven't had the chance to to see if there is uh, of course there will be options and any option will have a different consequences and that will be part of our decision making uh, need to, to do. But once again, evidence base is very important here to have a very transparent and accountable uh, decision. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Fyodor. Let's just uh, let's just give our first presenter here another round of applause. Huh? Thank, you. Thank you. And what we will do now is to uh, move uh, to the panel part of our dialogue here. So that means that you are also becoming a panelist now, Fjordaus, and uh, and then we have uh, Nok and Ilham as well. Uh, so welcome again to the two of you. And I just want to check whether we have our virtual panelists here. Okay, so Moira, oh, very good. So uh, our panelist from Samoa, Ms. Moira Felitutulu, uh, has joined uh, and i'm wondering if we could pin moira's uh, video to the screen so we can all see her that would be great uh, moira is the assistant chief executive officer uh, of the environment sector coordination division uh, of the ministry of natural resources and the environment of samoa so uh, welcome to you moira great great to see you there i was be i was afraid that we would have a connection problem <laughs> but uh, good to see you and a warm welcome Thank you, Rike. Greetings, everybody. Very good. And uh, I suggest that we jump straight into uh, the first set of questions for our panelists, if we could get them on the screen. 
and uh, uh, I will um, ask three questions actually for this first round to uh, to our panelists, and then uh, I will give each of you five minutes to speak to those questions. Um, and the questions uh, are here. Since I'm asking free, I thought it would be good that we can all see them on the screen so that we can keep our focus. But the questions and and um, uh, to you is is why measuring ocean wealth is important to your country or your national context. Secondly, how you measure progress towards sustainable development of the oceans and what do you consider your priorities for the future? And finally, what data do you need for sustainable management of the ocean and how do you make sure that those data are also used for policy so this is quite a mouthful five minutes is not so long uh, but i will ask you to stick to the time and i'll put my clock on so that we don't run way above uh, time and uh, i will i will ask you uh, not to kick it off and uh, the next five minutes are yours so let's hear what the status and thoughts are from Vietnam. Please, you have the floor. Okay, thank you, Erika. Uh, actually, as you may know, that Vietnam is a coastal country, and we have more than 3,200 kilometers of coastal line, and we have more than 3,000 island, and we have uh, 28 of coastal province among uh, third, uh, among 63 of uh, province of Vietnam, and the coastal province had contributed to around 50 percent of gdp of the country and uh, the ocean well is very important for the country because the ocean play a key um, contributor uh, for uh, um, for the country gdp and uh, many population live in the ocean areas and um, for that reason uh, the sustainable development of coastal area is high priority of government of vietnam and the Central Party of Vietnam had adopted the resolution on natural strategy on sustainable development of Vietnam marine economy to 2030 and vision to 2045, uh, with the goal of enhancing the sustainable social economic development and environment protection in the marine and coastal area in, in Iceland. In Vietnam, we have uh, do some pilots uh, apply some kind of ocean cartoon uh, introduced by my colleagues from Indonesia, and we have used the ocean account to uh, generate data. Uh, and uh, the 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 ocean cartoon get, uh, can be a tool uh, to monitor the the contribution of the ocean of marine sector to to the GRDP of the province and uh, what is the contribution of the marine sector to national GDP. And it's very important in indicator for the government uh, to see what is the contribution from the marine sector to the, uh, the um, country economy. And the, the ocean accounting tools, uh, it also support us to monitor what is the impact from different uh, sector to the marine environment and how we can reduce the pollution from the different sector to the environment. Uh, so uh, it's some kind of monitor different way and it's a very good tool to apply to, to different uh, coastal and province of Vietnam. And uh, it's, this tool is also very uh, important uh, for marine management as well. We can have a make decision uh, what, should, uh, what, what action should do and what action should be avoided. And this can be used for marine station planning. Uh, Vietnam is now developed the National Marine Station Planning and the S MSP uh, will be applied as provincial level as well. And uh, I do think that the ocean accounting could be a tool uh, for MSP at provincial level and also you for protected area management as well and see what is the trade up between development and uh, conservation so uh, give the right tune for the decision maker to give the right direction and right action thank you very much thank you so much Nog, and thank you very much also for sticking to the allotted time i'm very impressed <laughs> Um, so I, I'm hearing uh, things that actually resonate quite well with what we've just heard from Indonesia, and uh, and I was also very happy to hear that that the activities uh, so far is 
very, very directly linked to the stated policy priorities in Vietnam. And that's one of the ways to make sure that the support continues. So I suggest we move from Vietnam to the Maldives. Ilham, uh, you're next. Uh, please go ahead. Uh, thank you. Um, I will try to address uh, the three questions. Uh, first one, the importance of ocean accounting uh, to the Maldives, uh, or the ocean wealth to the Maldives. Um, as probably everybody knows, Maldives is an entirely an ocean country with 1 million square kilometers of ocean uh, and just 0.03% of land. And the land is divided into 1,192 islands which means um, the entire Maldives is dependent on a healthy ocean, the well-being of people, uh, the livelihoods, the economy, the tourism, the fisheries, everything is dependent on the ocean, a healthy coral reef. Our islands are formed from coral reefs, so uh, it's uh, a country which will not survive without coral reefs, uh, a healthy coral reef. Um, our fishermen, uh, fishery sector is um, the second highest employer in the Maldives after civil service and uh, supports one third of the population of the country. And which means um, the, uh, this, this one sector alone actually is um, very important to the well being of uh, our people. And then we have the tourism sector equally important, the agriculture sector equally important, depending on uh, natural resources. But then we see uh, the amount of destruction that's happening, habitat modification, the pollution, the climate change impacts that we have, regular uh, uh, impacts from um, uh, the severe storms. So these kind of impacts uh, actually make us wonder how long our coral reefs can support life in the Maldives. And to understand that, we would need to know what we have, the ocean accounts, or, or uh, the extent of damage, or the extent of um, survival rate. And to, uh, I think for this, the ocean wealth and knowing the extent of ocean wealth is very important. What we currently do is, uh, uh, Currently, our president uh, has made few pledges. One of them is to protect 20% of our ocean. And we have a plan to develop a marine spatial plan of the Maldives. And also a blue economy strategy is being developed. A strategic environmental assessment framework is also being developed. Uh, so we hope that these kind of activities actually uh, would make the ocean governance more sustainable in the future. Um, well, and, I, and we hope that through these kind of mechanisms, we'll be able to enhance the data uh, for sustainable ocean uh, development. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Ilham, and uh, oh, it's a wonderful panel we have today with uh, everyone just being on the dot. Uh, <laughs> and uh, and I, I, I mean, of course, what I'm sure we've all taken note of here is that we've moved to a full-fledged island economy, yeah, that's uh, where everything really depends on the ocean. And, uh, and, and uh, the fact that uh, there are strategies being developed and policy pledges being made, I mean, that's provides that foundation for for also a long term dig into the data and and strengthening that part of it so um, so a lot to do still uh, thank you so much uh, so let us uh, move to another island economy uh, move far to the east from bangkok uh, and to samoa and to moira uh, moira the next five minutes are yours please go ahead thank you richard um, so I'll forget everybody. Um, from Samoa, well, the reason why it is important for us to uh, know our ocean wealth, that's because, of course, like everyone else, we have a population of around 200,000 people, of whom many rely solely on land and sea for food and income. So, and around 70% of the population and our key infrastructure, economic infrastructure are located within the coastal areas. So it has been, the ocean has been 
a primary source of social and economic benefit that has sustained Samoan uh, communities for generation. Uh, so it, it really commands responsible stewardship and to be able to do that. Uh, and as we continue to develop our resources like um, the land and ocean um, for social and economic prosperity reasons, we need to account for the costs and the impacts of our actions on our oceans and the marine environment. And also with the worsening effects of climate change, uh, uh, I think we, that we have been experiencing knowing the wealth and the carrying capacity of our ocean is another determining factor of our resilience and ability to adapt to these impacts. Hence, um, and also not uh, mentioning the, the its contribution to the national GDP. So yes, it is important to us to know um, the oh, the wealth of our ocean. And um, with regards to the uh, progress towards some um, sustainable development of the ocean, uh, Samoa's 10-year ocean strategy, which was um, endorsed in 2020, really sets out the pathway for the integrated sustainable management and governance of Samoa's ocean and marine resources. So there are priority thematic areas there and uh, the threats that have been identified and which um, integrated uh, management solutions have been tailored towards. So with these strategic priorities that um, have been identified, it really ranges from establishing an enabling environment through ocean governance um, across multi-sectors and stakeholders to financial sustainability, enhancing research and data collection, monitoring and surveillance, as well as strengthening the legal frameworks and the capacity building and awareness. So one of the key targets there is looking at um, the marine spatial planning, mapping 100% of Samoa's offshore waters and coastal marine waters. Uh, via marine spatial planning by 2023. So that nationwide exercise is currently underway and it's uh, nearing completion. And also looks at um, strengthening its national uh, marine protected area networks by increasing the percentage from uh, currently 10% to 30% by 2025. So, and on the fisheries management side, um, well, there is ongoing work in developing community-based uh, fisheries management initiatives, um, which includes a variety of uh, things that covers um, the marine uh, ecosystems. So, and another key initiative is the mapping and uh, confirmation of our maritime boundaries. So to confirm the EEZ, and this needs to be completed by 2025. It is essential as it really defines the geographical scope of the um, strategy itself, as, as well as um, strengthen the surveillance and enforcement of our oceans. So this car, uh, later part is currently uh, uh, taking place in close collaboration with our development partners, that's um, including New Zealand, on the monitoring of our EEZ for um, illegal fishing um, activities. So um, also as part of the MSP process, um, a marine ecosystem service valuation was developed for um, several ecosystem uh, services in 2020. So um, these are part of um, the, uh, the approaches that have been uh, taking place to measure um, the progress towards um, how well we're doing with um, ocean uh, management. And to do with um, the data needs and, and data gaps, I think um, as similar to, every, uh, to um, other countries that I've uh, heard in this discussion is, um, of course, um, there's a lot, a wide range of uh, data gaps in terms of availability, the quality and accuracy of relevant data to support the exercise, the ocean accounting exercise and in turn inform national policy and planning. And it was very um, informative to um, see the presentation from Indonesia and how this uh, research and groundwork translates to um, informing the decision-making policy planning at the um, top level. So um, besides the um, ocean accounting work and evaluation um, exercises, been uh, we've also been uh, undertaking 
uh, currently undertaking the um, development of a fourth national state of environment report, uh, which looks at the, the current state of environment compared to 10 years ago. So um, again, it's where we are collating the data and identify um, the state of the ocean and um, what actions have been undertaken so far um, and making use of existing information. Um, and that's, I think my five minutes is up, but <laughs> thank <Wow>. you very much. <laughs> thank, you. thank you so much, Moira. Just, just as the bell Did I just there. hear the, 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 the timer? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, thanks. Thanks for that excellent overview, Moira. And, and uh, I think what, what, what the, the, the word that crosses my mind in terms of what's going on in Samoa is uh, the word urgency, because the, the number of deadlines uh, with, uh, that's coming up next year, the following year, 2025, I mean, it's, to me, that's a, that's a sign that whoever is making the decisions are, are really sensing that things need to happen very, very soon. So that's um, correct. So that's... Um, that's very encouraging, but I would also assume that from your cha chair, it would feel a little daunting at times, uh, because uh, because of course the pressure is is on as well, not least on your ministry. Yeah? Well, it's a it's a multi sector effort. So, um, of course, our Ministry of Agriculture and Fisheries and the Ministry of uh, MNRE, as well as our NGOs and civil societies, are all involved in this work right great okay thanks so much moira we'll uh, we'll revert to you uh, soon uh, what we will do now is to uh, move on to our next uh, two questions and we will hear from our panel again and i'll call on you in the same order as now uh, as i just did but this time around we'll also include our representative from indonesia so that you can also speak uh, and of course, as, as you've all you've all seen now, what we've heard from uh, from both Vietnam, the Maldives, and Samoa is is really a, a, a bit of an overview of what's going on. So so at, at this point in time, we have that overview now from four countries, uh, and uh, and what we'll then go into now is to hear reflections on main challenges and also recommendations. Um, uh, going forward and I see that we have uh, questions coming in and thank you very much for that what I will do is to promise that there's time to pick questions up when we've heard from each of our panelists again and then I'll revert to to those uh, questions so I suggest we we move ahead uh, and I'll ask uh, you again Nock, to kick it off kick off the round uh, and talk about um, what you see as the main challenges and also some recommendations and advice you may have from your rather long experience by now in this in this space actually so please please knock uh, thank you again uh, i i do think that uh, many country not only vietnam faced with uh, difficulty uh, in having comprehensive data by for uh, ocean management uh, the data is scattered and stored in many different organizations in different periods of time, and the quality of data is may not good enough to meet with the requirement. And how to have the comprehensive uh, data is the question for the country. How we can uh, bring all of the data from different units, from different agencies, so I scan you for uh, management purpose. Um, so the standard methodology at global, regional, and national level uh, levels could be required uh, to collect and develop a good database uh, for policy decision processes. Uh, at the national level, we may need uh, to have some kind of for, uh, for agency uh, to work with different line, uh, line ministry, line agency to, um, to help uh, to collect and to develop the database uh, to be applied to be applied at the national and provincial level. Uh, yeah, it may come up from the guidance from the uh, technical ocean accounting and adapt to the country uh, and to come up with standard uh, to be applied at national and provincial level. And it can be uh, uh, proposed some 
type indicator uh, to be applied as well uh, to, to measure the contribution of marine sector to economy and also the indicator to monitor the impact from uh, sector to the environment. Uh, and it's somehow it's difficult to uh, to be have a good data uh, with many efforts. So we may uh, make you a uh, global and regional data uh, for the country uh, to be you in some kind and to uh, to give some kind of bright decision. Uh, but I think the the country efforts in bring all stakeholders together uh, to have standard methodology and to have some kind of bright indicator could be uh, great to support the country to come up with the management uh, of coastal area. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Nock. And I will just move directly onwards to, to Ilham, please. And I've just, uh, just to alert you all, I've, I've reduced the time you have a little bit because we are running behind schedule. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, so I've just set it, reset it to four minutes. Please go ahead. Okay, thank you. I, I hope that I'll be short this time. <laughs> um, uh, so challenges, first now, when it comes to challenges, I think as a country that is recently starting with uh, ocean accounts and measuring the ocean wealth, uh, I think uh, the challenges are huge for us and because one of the things is the lack of awareness, uh, both at policy level, at local governance level, at, uh, different, in different institutions within the government, like they have never heard about ocean accounting in the first place. So uh, this awareness is very important. And that's one of the challenges that we face at this uh, moment as we start off uh, with ocean accounting. And, the, uh, and with that comes the capacity issues in the Maldives, because of course uh, you don't have capacity of something that you have never heard of. Um, so uh, the capacities might be here and there on accounting and economics and on conservation, but then uh, on really maintaining data and information of ocean wealth. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's um, the kind of capacity that we lack. And because of the small population of our country, you know, um, generating this kind of capacities within the country is a challenge. Uh, our population, you know, our working population is very small uh, as in any other uh, uh, small island developing state. So this kind of um, limited uh, capacities, human resources um, also uh economic resources uh, financial resources technologies um it brings about many challenges um and then the other issue comes with prioritization within the government and within communities like what communities prioritize uh, what uh, local governments prioritize what institutions prioritize uh, do they prioritize economic development? Do they care about conservation of environment? How much will they prioritize conservation? And one of the reasons why they don't really prioritize is probably because they don't really know the wealth of ocean. And um, so they don't probably relate to the importance of our ocean, the way that ocean supports our life. And again, that comes to awareness. Um, how, and coming to uh, the point that I raised earlier about fisheries, um, our GDP shows that our, our fisheries is on, contributes only 2% uh, to the GDP. However, it supports livelihoods of, of the well-being of one third of our population. So we don't really, uh, the GDP that, we, that currently is calculated doesn't really show the actual support the oceans give to the people or the dependency on the ocean itself. So I think this kind of lack of information uh, is one of the biggest challenges. Mm, uh, on the fifth question, I think uh, one of the, the things that I would recommend is uh, to make sure that our resources that we allocate on ocean accounts are not duplicated or uh, are not um, uh, uh, let's say, and there are uh, there are so many different kinds of accounts that are coming up, like CR Central Framework, the 
agriculture fisheries and um, how forestry frameworks. There are many frameworks and different institutions probably, they will soon start developing accounts in different um, areas and resources will be distributed between agencies and between um, institutions and to make sure that they don't overlap or conflict or, or that they are not duplicated. Well, this is one of the things that policymakers should keep in mind. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, uh, Ilham, and, and uh, what we've heard so far. Uh, I'm, I'm just thinking back on, on both some of the challenges, but also on these conflicting priorities that you mentioned. I'm, I'm sort of brought back to our initial presentation by, uh, by Firdaus from Indonesia in terms of this common interest again. I mean, how, how to establish that? And it's, it seems to me to be very important. Let's, uh, let's move on and, and uh, hear from from Samoa and Moira, some challenges, recommendations, advice. Please go <laughs> ahead, Moira. Thank you, Rike. I think we share the, uh, the same challenges to do with data gaps in terms of availability and the quality of data. And uh, it's the same uh, challenge that we're facing here. Uh, also, uh, Ocean Accounts, it's, uh, it's a very recent uh, approach and exercise here in Samo. So again, the awareness uh, issue, we also facing that we need to build that awareness of what it is and what it's for and its usefulness and how it um, translates to uh, informed uh, decision making. And uh, one of the things that uh, our Bureau of Statistics is currently working on at the moment, it's uh, uh, centralizing the data and uh, trying to include other um, uh, related uh, data like the environment, social information, so that instead of just the census and they're also building in including um, like the environment related info indicators so that uh, where, where areas there are where if there are areas where there is um, a dearth of information uh, we can input our relevant uh, environment indicators into their census uh, like uh, questions and stuff and uh, we can use when they t undertake the census we also collect information that are related to the environment um, indicators. So that way we're catching many stones with uh, many birds with one stone. And uh, also to try and gather information from other um, stakeholders, we use our sector wide approach that uh, we are currently um, using, where we um, use that uh, network to uh, collect our information. But uh, yeah, it's a work in progress for our peer of statistics. Uh, and uh, they, one of their advice uh, with regards to areas where there is no information available, data, instead of undertaking surveys, they opt to go for administrative data that already exists to, um, within the government agencies. And like, for example, the water bills and stuff, it gives you information on the usage, the, the cost, and the, the, the water, what you call the wastewater. Uh, so that kind of administrative data that is also that can be uh, useful. So with regards to uh, advice and recommendation, well, Samoa has always taken this approach of uh, trial and error and uh, learn by doing whatever is new, bring it on. We'll uh, try because that's where we learn what works and what doesn't. So uh, it, it, uh, what we've learned so far from the ocean accounting experience is that it's you can do it in phases. So it doesn't have to um, to be super perfect at once. You need to build on existing work and then continue on from there and continue to improve it on it. So um, yeah, and also we encourage collaboration with our development partners and our UN partners and across the region, um, you know, some South-South collaboration where we share information, um, and uh, ideas and experiences. Um, yeah, that will, I would recommend that. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Moira. And, uh, and I was, I was very uh, uh, heart, by, by heart felt warm when you started talking about what national statistical offices can bring to the, to the table, because uh, 
my regular work is very much focused on official statistics and working with national statistical offices such as the Samoa Bureau of Statistics and uh, and um, in addition to to the to the point you rightly mentioned uh, about uh, what one can get out of getting getting the national statistical offices involved is also that very often even though ocean accounting is new they have very good accountants at national statistical offices they know the system of national accounts and uh, and the the ocean accounts uh, I, I, I built on an extension of that uh, very common uh, statistical framework. So, uh, so I'm all for that. And um, thank you. Thanks very much for for sharing your your thoughts there. Uh, and I'm just looking. You know, I if it's so it's such a shame that we can't have you here in Bangkok this week, Moira. <laughs> but at least we get your beautiful background instead. <laughs> I'm, yes, I'm that's totally... a view from. That's a view from one of up at the our watershed areas up at the, the uplands. It's yeah, uh, it's a view of the lower Apia town area. So wonderful. Okay, thanks thanks very much, uh, Moira. Let's let's move on to to Indonesia and to you, Firdaus. A few thoughts uh, on challenges and some advice and recommendations from you, please. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Rika. In our context, actually, now the, the challenge is giving the proof that the ocean accounting is uh, working. Uh, we relatively successful to engage the, the, the minister and stakeholder and to, to show to them that the ocean accounting is a very powerful tool to be used as a tracking tools, tracking measures, and uh, to, to know our performance in uh, all three levels of sustainable pillars economy, social, and environment. But now the, the leaders and the stakeholders ask more and more, show me how it will be uh, implemented in a concrete way. So that's a big challenge actually now that uh, we, we need to, uh, to, to maintain the momentum and we need to prove that this is uh, doable, this is uh, operationable, and it can be implemented through all the instrument of uh, marine spatial planning, marine protected area and fisheries management in Indonesia. Because the, the minister asked, uh, give me the result that I can use uh, to shape my policy in our uh, fisheries and ocean. And our suggestion, of course, is, uh, is very, ocean accounting development is very contextual for every country. But I think let's start with uh, demand analysis first. Like Mark said in uh, her presentation, there is a big demand from the law, big demand from the planning document, big demand from the political uh, will, thing like that. And then if there is a lot of demand, then you can see that uh, so many people will be pushed to fulfill that demand. And you can cascade that demand into several line ministries and then start from that demand start from that uh, cascading then you will see who are your 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 partners who are your team that will share common interest and uh, common uh, agenda in in your country and then after that start with your existing data the ocean accounting development is very adaptive uh, practice uh, you you don't just like maura said you don't have to be in a perfect situation to start to work with the ocean accounting you can use existing available data while you you can look for uh, further assistance to make it more uh, uh, complete in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Fiedas. And I think uh, just be practical about this is what I'm exactly. hearing from you. Yes. So I think that's uh, that's great advice uh, going forward. So thanks uh, to all our panelists for your reflections and 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 inputs. And uh, it's now time to have a look at. Any questions that may have been posed in writing online? Any questions anyone in the room would like to? Yes, uh, I suggest that we go. There was a question from before. Can we just see that? Oh, it was just a comment. It wasn't a question. OK, OK, then uh, then let's move to the to the lady here in the room in the corner. If you could introduce yourself and then ask your question, please. Okay, so I'm Meena Bilgi from India. 
uh, I work a lot on natural resources management, not necessarily oceans, but all other environmental uh, issues. Um, my question is, uh, do we have uh, gender segregated data? When we are talking about uh, oceans, mm -hmm. I heard a lot about the data gathering. Uh, so I was wondering, uh, you know, a lot of women are also dependent on oceans. So is there any information, how many men, how many women, and so on? Uh, that was my question. And there's so much of gender dynamics around oceans. Yeah, that's a good point. Thanks very much uh, uh, from that for that question, Mina. I just want to hear if we have any other questions, because then I'll... I'll just collect them and then throw them at the panel in one go. Uh, anything else from our virtual audience? Anyone has any questions? Anything else from anyone in the room? All right. Okay. Um, no, well, while you guys think about coming up with a question more, then let's... Uh, Okay, Angela from FAO is asking if we could please share her observation from before. So if you could just move a little bit up in the chat so we can see that. Um, Angela is saying, thank you. It's very interesting to hear from the island countries very relevant to also highlight the important role of fisheries for food security, livelihoods, and national eco eco economies. Indeed, a good point. Um, and very often also, if we start linking the wealth of the oceans to the wealth of uh, ocean resources that are known commodities, it is a good way of convincing people that it actually matters to them as well. So. Um, so I think that's a, that's a very good uh, comment there. Uh, did I miss anything else from the comment list of comments? Any way, if you you can alert me, Paul. I know you are following that that line there. Okay. So then, uh, is does anyone want to speak to the issue of gender related information? Okay. Maybe uh, if. Yes, I, I think I'll, I'll just give uh, our, or oh, is it another question? Yeah, it's just another question? Okay, then ask that question as well. And then, uh, then I can hand it back to our panelists and they can choose which question they want to speak to them. Please, and, and please introduce yourself and then ask the question. Okay, uh, my name is Pichikon and I'm from the EDD. Um, so uh, a question about the uh, sustainable ocean management. So I just want to know if um, just a comparison between the pre and post COVID pandemic. Is there a change in the management system uh, within our region itself, like in our developing countries? Uh, was there an alternation in the management? Okay, thank you very much, Peshkan, for that uh, uh, that question. And just to to anyone who's not working for SCAP in this room, the, the term EDD refers to the environment uh, uh, division here at SCAP. So just so that you're all uh, all aware of that. And, uh, and, and the question here really, uh, I, I'm going to translate it a little bit saying, well, uh, does, is there any observable impact from the COVID-19 pandemic in terms of how uh, oceans are managed or the, or the or the conversation around that is that fair enough yeah. yeah so i'm just widening it a little bit that question all right so uh, i know uh, that there's been a lot of discussions about the increased use of of plastic resources for example and i'm thinking that might be what's in the back of your mind there uh, for that question but we basically have um, questions here from the audience that relate to anything um, uh, related to gender that's coming up either in your data work on ocean accounting or maybe as part of your priorities going forward and also if any data actually are available uh, to shed some light on some of the uh, gender dimensions let's say surrounding surrounding uh, ocean uh, management uh, and the second one uh, relates to uh, COVID and maybe what I'll do now is 
to give the floor to our panelists in the opposite direction. And that will, is also going to be your last comment, each one of you. So it's going to be, um, let's say, a one, a one minute, uh, a one minute uh, answer one or both questions if you can, or give us your last reflection from the dialogue today. So I will ask uh, you, Fjerdaus, to begin. And uh, it is indeed one minute we are looking at here. So please go ahead. Uh, thank you. Uh... I have no uh, complete answer for the gender, but of course we are working on that issue. And uh, yes, uh, it's, it's uh, in our region is uh, is a bit uh, it's not complicated, but uh, the gender sometimes uh, uh, not because uh, of the there is no uh, support for that, but for example, fishing fishing work is really uh, physical demanding so it's not because we don't want women into that arena but because yes it's, it's really difficult and very hard time doing uh, fishing the second one of course uh, in in one of our ocean accounting pilot in the kilimatra mpa uh, uh, pre-covid most of the community working as a tourist uh, uh, worker doing the diving guide uh, as a diving guide. So it's difficult to find a fisherman in that area. Once the COVID there and no visitors are coming to the island, to the MPA, then there's a change, become a fisherman again. So there is a change in the livelihood and there is a adaption on the, the management that we will apply to this uh, MPA. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fiedaus. And uh, we move to Moira and Samoa, please. Um, thank you, Rike. Uh, regarding the question on gender, for um, us here in Samoa, it's not like more a compulsory uh, reporting requirement now to have uh, gender and inclusive uh, as part of the inclusive like agenda, like to include gender uh, information in reporting of in in any projects. So it's uh, and 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 more so this aggregated information. So on, on I mean to provide for the um, involvement of, uh, of course the, the gender involvement in any projects and the, in the terms of beneficiaries and um, that sort of thing. So um, yes, it is um, a, a compulsory requirement now for reporting. And uh, with regards to sustainable ocean management, I think uh, with regards to the actual practical work of um, that um, uh, needs to be undertaken in terms of monitoring and surveillance. I think the lockdowns affected that physical, practical work. But uh, uh, with regards to ocean management, I think the, uh, it's through the waste, um, as uh, Rike has mentioned, about the increasing use of uh, plastics, disposable masks and stuff for the, the, the COVID um, PPEs. Um, yeah, I think that's one of the issues was the, the waste uh, was uh, that really affected um, uh, some of the, the efforts um, for the, the ocean cleanups, the waste audits that came out after the, the COVID. So, yeah, but uh, yeah, it, it's, it hasn't much um, affected the efforts in terms of the um, undertaking the policy work um, and strengthening the, the efforts at the national level. Uh, yeah, Thank that's you. that's all I can add in. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Moira. And uh, we move on to Ilham, please. Uh, thank you. On gender desegregated data, we do have data on uh, uh, fishermen, tuna fishermen, but then all of them are men. Um, there's uh, I know fishermen as such as, uh, of tuna is females. But then, um, as pointed out, I think you will read out the comment by FAO, there are many women involved in the processing of uh, fish, and uh, this data is not collected. And uh, however, we recently conducted an ocean use survey for the M MSP Marine Spatial Plan, and the data is yet to be yet to come. So we will see uh, some level of information from there, we expect that. Um, on post and pre-COVID, um, we really don't have much information on that, the changes as of now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Ilham. And I just want to add that uh, 
again, looking at the national statistical offices, they would often have uh, this type of information in their labor force surveys. Mm -hmm. Some of them do, yeah, but maybe not in the Maldives, but sometimes that includes employment uh, information disaggregated also. Um, let's move on. Last yeah. but not least, Nock, please. Uh, thank you. Actually, for um, the post-COVID, I think for most of the country, they try to encourage the tourism activity to, activity to contribute to uh, economic development of the, the country. And tourism is uh, one of the key sectors. Um, we have very high value to to province and coast and province and national GDP as well. Uh, and uh, actually, um, with the ocean accounting framework, we can uh, calculate uh, how the pollution from the tourism sector to marine resort and how to reduce this kind of pollution. And for for our pilot study with ISCAP, we have calculated the, the light pollution load from tourism sector, uh, but uh, mostly for from wastewater from the tourism uh, BOD, COD, but uh, maybe the waste account uh, from tourism sector could be um, could be developed in the future to see what is the impact of the tourism to the marine account, like uh, especially post-COVID situation. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Nog, and uh, especially for, for those suggestions there. And uh, we are now being alerted that for in five minutes from now the dialogue will close and that means we are right on time to give the floor uh, to our rapporteur michael uh, to to close our our dialogue here and maybe also give us a little heads up on what we are going to report when we are back in in the big room uh, <laughs> to all the others please michael you have the floor Thank you, Chair, <clears throat> and a big thanks to all of our panelists. And thanks also to those in the audience um, for your, especially to Angela at FAO and Mina and Petra Khan here for your inspired questions. A really interesting session, I'm sure you will agree, and lots of takeaways. There's, there's, a, there's way too much for me to play back to you in just a few short minutes, so I'll focus on, uh, on encouragement to those interested in pursuing ocean accounts, and to do so by the use of reflecting on Park Friedau's uh, initial uh, common issues related to the collection and organization of environmental, social, and economic data related to the ocean. Uh, and I'm, I'm confident, by the way, that these are the kinds of challenges that are, challenges that are shared by governments and institutions across the region. So importantly, while these are challenges, by the end of the session, I think that we had heard plenty of ways to navigate some of these, these challenges or common issues. So some quick reflections. Data, the first, uh, the first common issue explained by Friedhaus is that data is expensive to collect. And whether that's by sending out a scuba team or obtaining and processing satellite imagery, that is undoubtedly true which is why it is so, so important to be extremely targeted in data collection. And if we can start the process of compiling data into frameworks such as accounts, the gaps come into focus. We should target the gaps. The second challenge is that data is available only for a limited location or time series. And the experience of ocean accounting in the region shows us that there are some useful methods to fill gaps through interpolation or by using similar data sets as reference. In addition, limited data or small geographic scope can still provide valuable information for policy if the accounts are fit for purpose. The third challenge uh, outlined was that data is scattered across many institutions. This is another way of saying that the data already exists, or at least a lot of it does. And it's just a question of working together to gather and compile it. One great suggestion was to identify common interests and goals or shared key performance indicators across institutions in order to start on the path of building agreements and bringing information together for better effect. The fourth challenge was that data is difficult to share. One suggestion from the recent UN Oceans Conference is open access, whereby institutions who have data can upload it to a common platform a common location for it to be utilized by others for collective benefit. And the fifth challenge described was that 
data is available, but no information is produced. Success, of course, is never granted, but uh, never guaranteed. But the more data we collect, the more we collaborate, the more we share, and the more we put data into common frameworks uh, that are interoperable with the existing environmental and economic frameworks, the more likely we are to develop useful insights and evidence. So these are all really very real challenges, but the fact that they have already been so well defined means that they, we are already on the way to solving them. Many in the audience will know much better than me that it's not easy to work across government and across institutions, but the good news is that there are people already doing it and we can learn from them. I'm sure that each of the panelists here today will be very happy to talk to you further about their journey in developing evidence for sustainable ocean management and certainly the team at the Global Ocean Accounts Partnership and I, I know SCAP are also keen to connect. I'll see you in plenary. Thank you so much and uh, thanks to everyone. Should we just give ourselves a round of applause? Huh? <laughs> okay, and that includes Moira there who's smiling on the screen. So that's great. Good.